I think grief might also be motivating a lot of the light skin, light colored eye, homophobic spiritual crystal girlies. Be careful who you buy your crystals from. Have you processed your grief, babe? What is grief to you? Hey guys, it's Julesy and I'm back for another video. We are giving, mm, you know, try to spice it up. Give a little bit of an ethereal vibe since we are talking about superheroes and people who generally would describe themselves as godlike. I'm sure that's why you clicked on this title. Now, this is going to be an analyzation of two subjects who both exploit their power to subvert processing their grief. Kanye West and WandaVision. Now, we have to give a thanks and a big shout out to Audible for even allowing me to be here because you know otherwise. <laughs> Deuces. And also this Audible partnership has also allowed me to collab and do deeper dives into topics of really big interest to me. So shout out to Audible. You know, as always, there's always gonna be a ton of literary references and you can find a lot of these literary references on Audible, which has original audiobooks, It has original podcasts, a lot of original content and some of my most favoritest reads are on the app. So audible.com slash Julesy or text Julesy to 500, 500 and get your first month free audible you know and then come on over and join the sbg book club this month we are reading bad fat black girl by cecily bowen and it is a bomb it's like having a conversation with your homegirl listening to the audiobook this is what my current listen is on audible so come on over to sbg book club we have a new website sbgbookclub.org donate to our gofundme while you're here but yeah babes Smart Brown Girl is now SBG Book Club and every one of all identities is welcome. Now you want to go on over and pick up Bad Fat Black Girl by Cecily Bowen on Audible. Have a key with your homegirls and then come on over to the SBG Book Club where we are having live discussions and hopefully, fingers crossed, an author chat because this is such a good read that touches on the themes of, you know, fat phobia, anti-blackness classism and we are having a great discussion and if you are new to audible use my audible link audible.com slash julesy or text julesy to 500 500 get your first month free and pick up bad fat black girl or you can pick up the audiobooks for any of the other literary references i make throughout this video now as i said this audible partnership has allowed me to collaborate and do deeper dives in this video i feel like the co-written title really isn't enough to give a shout out to Henny, they, them pronouns, please use them respectfully, but Henny, well, I can't even say their name, it's simply Henny on the, because they, they're they Henny on the talk, Henny on the tweet, Henny on the gram, but you know, most popularly known as Henny on the talk, you should definitely go follow them and get prepared because once they la launch that YouTube channel, baby, it's over. It's over, okay? And I really appreciate the amount of thoughtfulness and deeply critical thought that Henny put into this collaboration. So shout out to them. Definitely support and follow them on their links down below. To give a brief overview of this, Wanda Maximoff, a superhero in the Marvel movie series. And her actual character is supposed to be of Romany heritage, but is sanitized down from a historically pressed people to a vaguely European representation. Now Wanda's narrative in WandaVision offers up a white woman as a rebel, which removes the nuance while tacking on a layer of whiteness that eerily mirrors the reality of how the weaponized performance of white woman fragility functions to ultimately uphold patriarchy. Now this does not mean that I disliked WandaVision. I thought WandaVision was an excellent piece of television. But I also think that Wanda was an epic example of white woman fragility, especially in how she digs into the power, not only the power of her as a superhero, but the power of her as a white woman and uses that to subvert having to process her grief. And actually, you know, even though I'm going to have a really heavy critique of the character, I do think regardless of identity, that there is within WandaVision, and when you think about the motif of grief throughout the series, there is a way for us to all 
feel seen in that representation. When you are dealing with the loss of person, the, the biggest grief is the loss of future memories of how you saw that person living with you throughout your life. I will never forget, I had a homeboy who passed away in a really tragic accident when I was in my mid twenties. At his funeral, one of my other homeboys was like, you know, he's like, what's really gonna hit us? There's gonna be some moment where you're just doing something ridiculous, like cooking some type of food, or you open the refrigerator to look at something, or you know, you're tying your shoe. You're gonna have a, a crossover of this memory in which you know, that friend was supposed to be there with you in that moment and is going to hit you really hard. He's like, that's the hardest part of grief. And I actually think that can mirror across a plethora of ways in which we might have to grieve, right? Not just a loss of like physical life, but obviously the loss of a relationship. Also, the ending of your past self. When we are going through our journeys of, I would call reconciliation with ourselves, right? If we're going through a growing or healing journey, you do also have to grieve the way you used to see yourself and letting that go. You grieve the loss of work, you can grieve failure. You know, there's so many things that, ways in which grief shows up in our life. And I wanted to talk particularly about WandaVision and Kanye because I think they are both really robust examples of American capitalistic patriarchal society that has, you know, fixated us or manipulated us into a hyper individualism where we don't have what you would call pastoral care. We don't have a communal understanding of processing grief that exists in other like African, I'm thinking of like Somalian or even West African culture where you have a period of grieving and your family comes together and there's a recognition that like, Grief is not something that you barrel through. It is something that you have to sit in, that you have to allow yourself to feel, that you do have to process. And in, when, in, in actuality, it's not that you rid yourself of grief, it is that you grow around the grief. And we don't necessarily have that sort of structure of pastoral care in American society. Both Kanye and Wanda have invested in a patriarchal power structure. And I see a lot of overlap in their character arcs after watching WandaVision, which is on Disney Plus, and the recently released documentary Genius on Netflix. And I actually have a review of Genius on my Patreon as someone who was a former employee of Kanye and Donda West at Good Music when it was at the Sony building. I saw a lot of old colleagues in the documentary, brought back a lot of memories. I had a lot of thoughts. And you can go holla at my Patreon, watch that review and catch more exclusive content. As I've already said, what we're looking at is the intersection of Kanye and Wanda and how they subvert grief by manipulating their power. Now Kanye has his own success, wealth and celebrity status. He even likens himself to a modern God, you know, akin to a superhero here. His come up as a producer turned rapper and his training and mastery, then leaning into his mother's passing in early 2007, that was a catalyst for his subsequent greatness. Kanye actually very much so has a sort of superhero arc especially if you when you look at genius and you kind of get this behind the scenes look of Kanye attempting to get signed to Rockefeller being really gun ho about it working on his skill you know being a young guy in the music industry and then his mother passes away and he, his celebrity, which he had already reached at that point just goes into another stratosphere. I actually thought and I get into this in the review I did on Patreon, I didn't need genius to be a critical look at Kanye. I could acknowledge that fully, it wasn't a critical analysis of the person Kanye. It was analysis of Kanye, Donda West, and Cootie, and the friendship Cootie had with Kanye. The one thing that I did think that then the sort of narrative that was offered in Genius kind of overlooked was as someone who used to work at Good Music and knows who G. Roberson is, and knows who these people, what hip hop is 1978 and who that is to Ye. I did think that the narrative of Kanye struggling to get signed to Rockefeller was a bit of an embellishment. And so you could say, in essence, it is true that Genius is a PR move for Kanye. I don't think that was Kudi and Chike's intention, but in having Kanye having to sign off on a documentary about him, it obviously is going to have to position him in as, and at least a neutral 
life. There wasn't necessarily any critique or analysis of the person that Kanye has come today, the harm that he's done in that process. Now, WandaVision sees Wanda Maximoff stepping into the role as the iconic Scarlet Witch, which fans are familiar with from the comic interpretations. Taking place after the death of Vision, and I'm sorry, y'all, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a casual Marvel watcher, so don't eat me up too much here, but it, this does take place after the passing of Vision in the um, Avengers saga with Thanos and the Infinity Stones. But within the WandaVision series, Wanda awakens in an idyllic Westview, New Jersey. In this world, people are cheery, prim, and proper, and each episode kind of processes through iconic television series that often do feature, you know, very white woman characters in a patriarchal role, right? This isn't necessarily to be like a review of WandaVision, but there are so many motifs that you can even extrapolate from the progression of the series against the backdrop of the progression of TV shows and how when you get into these more progressive eras, how a Wanda's role changes or how the themes in the show change. But as it turns out, Wanda has created this Westview to subvert having to deal with the grief of the loss of vision and obviously the future memory. She was holding on to the possibilities of their future together. Um, Wanda is surrounded by a community, but isn't in community. And the result is really like a lack of accountability while violence continues to be carried out. Imagine being sucked into an alternate reality where you are there to perform someone's future memories. You don't have any access to your former sense of self. In our patriarchal society, capitalism and organized religion coexist and function to keep cisgendered men as influential and wealthy as possible with them encountering insignificant or manageable opposition. Now the patriarchy is both an institution and performance that is equal parts cultural and interpersonal, allowing cisgendered men to remain oppressive and in power. Its mode of operation is to continually absorb and sanitize through a like-minded culture that allows resistance, the radical and the revolutionary, to exist only as temporary obstructions before ultimately refitting its purpose in favor of the status quo. Now that's, that's a really like heavy explanation. I know when we have these conversations, right, for like a general audience, differentiating between capitalism and patriarchy and that within American society, what makes our capitalism so distinct and so harmful is the patriarchal framework at which our capitalism exists within, right? Not simply that the capitalism itself is the problem. It's the imperialism, which comes, is rooted in the patriarchy, um, and the, the various isms that all kind of lean back to patriarchy. And I know we're talking about WandaVision, right? But I'm not gonna go too far into the theory here, but a lot of theory you can read Making Whiteness by Elizabeth Grace Hale, um, the history of whiteness in America. I am an American history historian. I do focus on race. Um, but the general making of whiteness and particularly womanhood for white women is foundationally formed to their sovereignty to whiteness and white men upholding their access to whiteness. This is a really complicated and layered theory and I don't wanna get too far off of this because I wanna make sure that this video is very, very accessible. But I realize I'm saying patriarchy and a lot of people think patriarchy as toxic masculinity, as something that is inherent to men. It's no, patriarchy benefits the cisgendered, really white man to the nth degree and allows life to be very manageable for them, but patriarchy has no gender. We all participate if we're not aware in some function of patriarchy. And actually Dr. Joy James in, was it Shadowboxing, has a critique on black feminism that is built off of the same 
framework of we live in a society and you can actually then get into neoliberalism and it's like we're just going to call it we're just going to refer to it as patriarchy because at the root of it it's all patriarchy and if I start using these other words I then have to define and get into the theory of these other words right but that in the society structure that we live in something like a black feminism that is radical or revolutionary but that often the radical or revolutionary rhetoric only seen as a temporary abstraction because it will be sanitized and co-opted into our more mainstream rhetoric before ultimately being refitted so that it's in favor of the status quo. I mean, we can see this with something like Black Lives Matter and the whole fallout coming around the national organization or even the accusation of certain people who have positioned themselves as radicals, you know, getting sponsorships by Shell, working with Wells Fargo. This pipeline of activist to influencer, right? It is something that the status quo can now profit from and commodify. And then it leads us with the same dominant class of cisgendered white men remaining on top with a submissive managerial class working in their favor and an oppressed workforce at the bottom. Definitely, actually, I was gonna say I need to do discussion on shadow boxing, but Bree Reed, who is a cohort member of the book club, uh, syllabi cohort member on her Patreon actually did a really good breakdown of this chapter that I'm talking about in shadow boxing. So I definitely will link that down below as well. Tons of links. We'll have a whole syllabus available on Patreon. Okay, get into it. Now, before we get back to specifically Wanda and Kanye West, I wanna acknowledge that we will be using archetypes. The Jugian, oh, if I, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but Carl Jung has, I might not even be saying that right. The man is like Swedish. <laughs> but plenty, he is very influential in the world of analytic psychology. Now this dynamic can best be analyzed and understood by using these archetypes produced by Carl Jung to identify personalities that can be real or fictional people who are presented in relatable narratives that affirm patriarchy through sympathetic framing of patriarchal violence which is justified by a now manipulated collective unconscious. The narrative functions as the patriarchy's control of oppositional personalities and the perceptions of those personalities. So I'm gonna I'm make this make sense. So just ride with me here because we're gonna look at the archetypes of obviously hero, artist, and rebel. And the hero or savior archetype are aspirational figures that set out to improve the world by achieving expert mastery and proving themselves through courageous acts. Often depicted as strong with the fear of being vulnerable, weak, or incompetent. And we see this in our two personas, right? With Kanye West and with Wanda, right? That their ability to be perceived as heroes also gives a lot of space for them, their unwillingness to approach their grief. And it doesn't actually detract from their persona. It uplifts them as even higher um, ideals, as even more godlike, because we relegate this idea of grief as a very human or mundane part of life, even though in both of the portrayals we see of them, particularly with Genius and with WandaVision, that their unwillingness to go through the grief is actually eating away at them. It is to their detriment. But do we have a collective understanding of how detrimental that subverting grief actually is? Or do we just see the power that they hold? So this idea of the hero being depicted as strong, but you know, unwilling to be vulnerable or emotional uh, is a recognizable template for the hero's journey and the simultaneous savior complex that comes with that. It's a reliable narrative that really does persist in all sorts of media. I think if we kind of reframe the hero as the savior complex, plenty of media comes to mind. And how have we even absorbed that as individuals, this idea that like we can resolve everything on our own that we are the ones that our power comes in being able to deal with anything with as little emotion as possible. 
you know? It's familiar and it's relatable, but most importantly, it's an effect, it's very effective in a society that does absolutely promote hyper individualism and overcoming hardship as a means to ultimate productivity. You can quickly make connections to why this narrative resonates so strongly with Americans in particular. The hero is an archetypal narrative that has been a very useful tool of propaganda in support of the patriarchy and often used to justify, again, patriarchal violence in the name of strategically abstracted greater good. And honestly, I think when you look at, so like, Think about patriarchalistic violence in this frame, right? When we, there used to be this generally accepted historical theory or framework that enslaved black people on the plantation, that their relationship to the master, to the slave master, that the slave master had a paternalistic outlook. They were able to make the best decisions for their population of enslaved black people on the plantation and that they had their best interests. It's where we then post emancipation, get this idea that respectability politics and accommodationist uh, maneuvers are the way in which we can buy into American society because this ideal that has been set by the slave master, because of all the wealth they had accumulated, they are the most knowledgeable. They are what we should aspire towards, never minding that their ability to succeed heavily relied on the labor of black folks. <laughs> it, it gets real, it gets real, you know what I mean? Tied up, knotted up in here, but trust me, the use of identifying this as patriarchy makes sense because it's paternalistic outview that I have the best idea of how to take care of all these people. That you just have to trust me, even though I have major hubris, even though I'm lacking as an individual in this very glaring way, you know, no, it is me because look at my power. Look at my talents, look at me, you know? It's a savior complex. Now, in an essay for NPR.org back in 2016, Glenn Weldon assesses the inherent patriarchal and latter fascist function of superheroes. And I'm gonna quote directly here. He stated that superheroes are democratic ideals. They exist to express what's noblest about us. Selflessness, sacrifice, a commitment to protect those who need protection and to empower the powerless. Superheroes are fascist ideals. They exist to symbolize the notion that might equals right, that a select few could dictate the fate of the world, and that the status quo is to be protected at all costs. Both of these things are true and extricably bound up with one another, but they weren't always. Now, the values of sacrifice, commitment to protect those who need protection, and to empower the powerless are masculine attributes reinforced by a biblical patriarchy that gets to cherry pick how sacrifice is performed. Allah, he gave his only begotten son. Who gets to see, be seen as their sacrifice being attuned to this mythical holiness versus whose sacrifice is a deficiency of oneself. It dictates who deserves commitment and who is deserving of protection and strategically selects which of the powerless can be empowered under its tutelage. Wyden's assessment actually shows the progression of how patriarchy adopts new modes of operation to sustain itself in the cultural zygus, how it will constantly evolve with the times, even as we have become a more progressive society. A lot of our progression, and you know, we talk about this in my recent video about colorism and R&B, previous videos I've done on like the makings of a Billie Eilish and TikTok and how, you know, this black community really is the cultural reset. We are the movers and the shakers of, of the basis of American culture, right? But even as maybe individuals of us get accepted into the mainstream, as soon as their product becomes a mainstream entity, you know, it's sanitized 
and re and restructured for the status quo and then you know the the status quo the patriarchy the status quo just rearranges itself to let that piece in in a very sanitized function but keep everybody else out you know the paternalism of it all it's the way that we will see people simply because of wealth and celebrity we will see them as intellectuals as leaders of the community and our entertainment industry, absolutely, it uses representational politics as a framing tool to detract from patriarchal violence. You know, it'll say, look, we, this person was let in. No, we don't have an issue with these things because, you know, it even started to happen in the comments on my colorism and R&B video, even though, you know, shout out to that collab with Hetty. That was also a very thorough production, all right? Okay? And people are in the comments like, no, but so, these five people are famous. These five people are doing well. What do you mean there's a problem? There is no problem. People will say colorism doesn't exist because look at these people that are doing well. Oh, classism isn't a problem because look at this person that picked themselves up by the bootstrap and made it out of poverty. And somehow we don't understand how to better, when it comes to providing better care, pastoral care, for our communities, we don't understand it. But on the flip side, when it comes to our carceral state and our modes of punishment, we definitely understand that one person means that we have to completely change everything to protect all the people. Mm, patriarchy. You see how the patriarchy functions? We see how it functions. And, they are, and how oppositional personalities wearing the faces of the oppressed are presented as aspirational or empowered after previously being antagonized. And here is where we come to the artist and rebel archetypes, right? The hero narrative is really used to accommodate the gradual transition away from like a rigid biblical patriarchy by controlling the oppositional roles of artist and rebel in our modern media entertainment. We can clearly see these connections to Wanda as an actual superhero and Kanye, who was a self-proclaimed God or savior within the hero savior archetype. Now Kanye also represents the artist and Wanda represents the rebel. And the artist is a successful black celebrity musician struggling publicly with grief and mental illness in a problematic and harmful way. And the rebel exists in media as an unintentionally violent, superpowered, neurodivergent woman also struggling with grief. Now within these archetypes, both this rebel and this artist are using their power to subvert processing their grief. But the narrative of grief is also used to excuse, minimize, and justify the hot violence and harm that they both enact. And I think it's because we can relate to that lack of wanting to deal with the grief. I mean, I honestly, after watching WandaVision, I had a conversation with my my therapist about like the ways in which I've also tried to deny going through the grief and how like I have caused, you know, I haven't harmed others in the process. I really just self-inflicted more harm on myself um, by not allowing myself. Cause I really, I hate being sad. I don't think any of us actually enjoy it, but it is something that I have to acknowledge and allow myself to go through. Like I have to allow myself to be upset. I have to allow myself to grieve. I have to allow myself to grow around it. But much of this hero narrative insists that grief is a great motivator to perform better and be more productive. And baby, I'm an Aries. You upset an Aries, especially an Aries woman, we are launching a new business. We are launching, I, I ended up back in grad school. I was so damn sad, okay? But <laughs> that's actually not the function of grief. Grief is not meant that we go through however many cycles of grief and come out these magnificently transformed people who can show it through our material production. You know, because that sort of narrative fails to acknowledge that grief is a necessary step towards healing. 
It is not something that you run through or avoid, but it is a process that one goes through and obviously you grow around it, but that growth doesn't need to be visibly signified outward to other people. That growth is internal. That growth is within your sense of self. That growth is through your journey of healing and forgiveness and redemption internally for yourself. And it honestly does require that you are being poured into by a community. That it allows for people to come in and show love and care and compassion. And it is very unfortunate that this hyper individualistic neoliberalism, okay, and because neoliberalism also is a form of patriarchy that constantly reshifts again and claims like this liberal politic, but it's so invested in the patriarchy that it constantly reconforms to suggest that no, you are the problem. You are the reason for your thing, for your issues. There are no systemic issues at play here. There's nothing wrong with this societal structure. No, it's just for you. And here, if you buy these things, you'll get it together. But I really do wish, you know, I understand that the ability to have community in the society is definitely a privilege. And I wish that more of us just had access. It would require safety, would require a lot of things in order for that community to actually function as a form of care. But I wish more of us had access to that. And so, in, but instead of that, we also get ways in which grief is also addressed to co-sign narcissistic misunderstandings of an individual's place in the community as a whole. The hero narrative and the subsequent savior complex instills in many people who internalize these messages an uncritically exacerbated cross-section of hyper-individualism and neoliberalism, two significant pillars of American society. You know, it doesn't acknowledge the people that are in harm's way, the people that they step over or step on. It doesn't acknowledge the people that allow all these ways that the community functions in very, what might feel minute, but those are, those are life-changing modes of support and allows a person to ascend. No, it's just that I am great. I am all being. I am the one that knows. Hear me roar, essentially. Um, but now to get into like, I think there's enough ways you can already see how these two subjects play in to this narrative that we are constructing here, right? We have Kanye West, the artist, already tying his identity to a bootstrap rhetoric, right? The idea that he, you know, came from Chicago, worked his way up, made it as a producer. Um, and you know, within representational politics, his blackness often does afford him a sort of identity shielding. This is a term created by Shaheem McLaurin, who also I collabed with them on a previous video, shout out to them. Um, and they use this term identity shielding, which aids in skirting consequences for harmful behaviors. So Kanye's identity as a black man often allows him to shield himself from the consequences of his harmful behavior so as long as he actually aligns with the dominant class with the patriarchy and is able to secure a level of influence and power for himself and i mean just to put that colloquially we even see this in genius in part three right when cootie decides to turn off the camera because kanye is clearly kind of spiraling but there is nobody in that room that is going to challenge him I actually talk about this again in my review about his relationship with Rhymefest, which, you know, I appreciated the documentary, I enjoyed it, but I also understand the critique of it not giving a critical lens. And it didn't offer really the history of his relationship with Rhymefest, who appears in episode one in the late 90s, early 2000s, and then again in the part three, which is in the more recent era of Kanye, and what it means for Rhymefest to be in that room, what it means for nobody in that room to be challenging Kanye or correcting him and allowing him to just kind of sit in his uh, self-proclaimed grandeur regardless of how that is harming other folks. We see that, you know, 
it, it is quite a while because like the harm the Kardashians have caused in their own way and the way that they have protected Kanye and they've also allowed they've been part of that patriarchal society that inculcates him and allows him to get away with the things he can get away with in ways that black women and black queer folk aren't afforded those same kind of opportunities and really the broader spectrum of black men aren't really afforded they, they can aspire to that they can believe that they that is attainable, but with a broad spectrum of them, it's largely not something many of us in the black community will ever have access to. And performing this sort of bad behavior and being so well shielded by using our black identity as that shield. But you know, in his inner his divorce with Kim and the way he has publicly accosted her, the way he has threatened violent acts, the way he has, you know, put that, those violent images in his music videos. And he still has a community of support that will be like, oh, it ain't that bad. Y'all taking it too serious. Y'all doing too much. He's just a black man struggling. He don't have access to his children. You know, the, the trope of him being this woeful black man is constantly used. <laughs> We got this new thing called classism. It's racism's cousin. This is what we do to hold people back. This is what we do. And we got this other thing that's also been working for a long time where you don't have to be racist anymore. It's called self-hate. It works on itself. It's like real estate of racism. Where just like that, when someone comes up and says something like, I am a God, everybody says, who does he think he is? I just told you who I thought I was, a god. Now, in the documentary, I did read kind of like a my friend Kanye, right? So like Cootie's overview of their relationship and their trajectory. And I think through that framing, you are allowed to kind of produce your own critique without the film often the subjectivity of a critique. It allowed the film to remain objective, but kind of allows a viewer to extrapolate their own critiques. Now on the flip side, I do think it, it also is a PR move that allows people to forget the bad behavior. See that Donda West passed suddenly in late 2007. Now, that narrative, there's that's a there's a hefty weight to that narrative. It is absolutely a true series of events. And in Genius, we are given an interior look at the intimate side of the story. We get up close footage of Kanye's deepest wound and Donda's passing is regarded as the event that forced Kanye inward to shift the gears and become a misunderstood mogul. And I don't even think that maybe, is it fair to say that the documentary is the only thing that sets it up? I think this is, I think it confirms the narrative that Kanye had already himself set up, that Donda West passing was almost like a necessary catalyst for his subsequent greatness. Akin to the tragic death of like Spider-Man's Uncle Ben, or the demise of Cal L's birth parents in Krypton, or Bruce Wayne's parents in the fateful alleyway in Batman. And Kanye's narrative fits into a very common trope of a hero's journey that marks their passage into adulthood by suppressing grief through a savior complex. That instead of going through the grief and allowing yourself to grieve, you instead turn and see yourself as an emotionally withdrawn hero. I think the last Batman that was entirely too long definitely kind of gives the same very much of the same motif and absolutely in Kanye West case he believes the world needs saving and he and his arts are the vessels for salvation I am the number one most impactful artist of our generation I am Shakespeare in the flesh we didn't get in genius any preview of his tumultuous relationship with Amber Rose, the scandalous award ceremony confrontations with America's perennial sweetheart, Taylor Swift, or the materialistic cultural reset with Jay-Z or even the progression of his relationship between Dame Jazz and Jay-Z, or those damning cosides of misogynoir and appropriation through his marriage to Kim Kardashian, through his, you know, presidential campaign, through his, you know, through his support of Donald Trump, 
there's a lot to consider if we understand the magnitude of Donda's passing and how Kanye just kind of barreled through that grief. And it didn't matter who he knocked over in that way. Even if you just consider that he blamed his fame for his mother's passing um, because her plastic surgery ended up being fatal. But then for him to go and marry into the Kardashian family, a family that very much so co-ops the black body through plastic surgery. Then we come to the image of Kanye, Marilyn Manson, and the baby on a recreated stoop of his mother's Chicago home with a lit cross beaming from the rooftop. It's like the way Kanye invokes religion really highlights how religion falls to patriarchy. That someone can invoke God. And it literally is. And we see we see this in the, we see this in the church. Absolutely. The particular use of men to be able to invoke God's name to skirt any accountability to allow people to turn a blind eye to at minimal unethical behavior. The way Kanye invokes religion, the extreme way he takes it. And we see parallel to these men in the church, how Kanye's ability to invoke religion is like this, allows for this inevitable redemption and absolution of pathologically violent and abusive men. Kanye went from running his own presidency campaign to fully adopting the church into his personal life as a born again Christian and him as the head of the church, him as the savior of that church. He shifted gears to produce three gospel rap albums beginning with Jesus is King. And Kanye still believes that his art can absolutely save the world. I just told you who I thought I was, a God. I just told you, that's who I think I am. And so this setup allows so that his behavior is seen as, oh, well, he's a black man who's been subjugated and oppressed by this white supremacist patriarchy. But what we're really doing is cherry picking what aspects can serve him so that he is able to be the vanguard of how patriarchy's newer modes of operating can exist in a more woke society. Kanye is the artist and his pushing his grief into an exploitation of power allows this to be the catalyst for him becoming the hero. Now we're gonna move into Wanda and WandaVision, the rebel. And the rebel archetype is figures that don't play by established rules and seek to disrupt, shock, or destroy structures that don't work in their vendettas for either revolution or revenge. And they're often depicted as having natural talents for outrageousness and radical freedom. They are often positioned as the radical and revolutionary but they are quickly absorbed and distilled into our society. Um, and I think this representation is why it is in media so that we don't think about how radical, the radical and revolutionary gets snuffed out. They're either absorbed into the status quo or they're killed off. You can quite literally look at like the radical revolutionary leaders of Africa, the continent. Do you see, do you, do you? Do you see? Now Wanda Maximoff is a character with an uncontrollable ability powered by aptly named chaos magic. Boundless energy and power that cannot be controlled by US military forces. And the rebel as an archetype is someone who is inherently oppressed. Now, for whatever reason, Disney Marvel stripped the ethnic rooting of Wanda as a Romani. And I, you know, it does set her up to allow to be played by a white woman, in this case, Elizabeth Olsen. I think um, some of us can see it as a conscious motif. Does it go far enough? Mm -hmm. You know, but we do get the makings of the white woman fragility as an allegory of grief. When Wanda is affronted by this grief, we catch glimpses of a different reality that anger her and cause her to break character. She's very much so.
You know, it's kind of funny because in one of the episodes, she's breaking character with a very, very caring like white woman, right? But it's like, what well, so is Wanda. <laughs> Wanda doesn't care about the people. She cares about herself. <laughs> Wanda isn't a reality of her own making. And the ability that her superpowers afford her in order to protect herself from whatever she subconsciously deems threatening. And in this case, the reality of loss, the dismantling of her future memories, the grief that is the grief is literally the most threatening to her. And baby, I know we, we, we digging into the white woman fragility, but I, I, I understand seeing grief as a threat. And if it wasn't for me being in therapy, I, I don't have the means or the power to do anything close to Wanda, WandaVision or even White Woman Fragility, right? I cannot cry and have people uh, do harm to others for me. It definitely took me some work to get over how threatened I felt by my own grief. How I felt like my the feelings of sadness, of overwhelming sadness, of grief, of loss, of just the the most banal and mundane things I would cry over, whether it was the ending of a relationship or the physical loss of loved ones in my life, that that grief just takes the wind out of you. And in the very early stages, I tried everything to just deny it. But if I wanted to heal, if I wanted to be able to grow and become a person who loves myself and who can both receive love and give love, I had to let go of seeing grief as a threat. You know, it kind of sucks, right? Many of us, if we were in Wanda's position and we were afforded that sort of white woman preview where we didn't have to think about who we were harming in doing this, would choose or opt to hold on to a lost loved one and instead create a reality where we can continue on together. And there's no way where that reality would just be the two of us. So we want, you know, because the one thing about grief is that it also makes you feel like the world stopped and everyone's moving on without you. And so, you know, many of us, maybe even subconsciously, would likely reconstruct these worlds where we still get to live in the world with our loved one but the the because that loved one is gone or because that relationship has ended or because you know whatever loss we are grieving has ceased to exist even if to take it away from other people even if we're thinking about growing as a person and transforming and grieving the sense of self you had before right or grieving the ways you used to formally deal with obstacles and considering that like you know you have to grieve that if you live a life of regret that you have to let go of that regret you have to grieve whatever sense of loss comes from the realization of the mistakes you've made and sometimes it's easier just to hold on to sort of like the delusion of maintaining your mistakes of maintaining bad behavior of continuing to do things for instant gratification rather dealing with the long-term feelings of loss or insignificance and processing that to grow in your healing journey right that a lot of us would reconstruct worlds where people exist in the reality that we create and we allow ourselves to not have to deal with that the heavy weight of grief i understand how relatable the show was and i think it actually did a good job in relating that grief to the broader ways in which we subconsciously th at least think about grief even if you know a white woman gets the privilege of enacting her power through grief in a very obscene way but then what happens is this allegory falls apart when controlled within the reality that wanda existing as a privileged and overpowered white woman is a perfect victim of the patriarchy because she also holds the lion's share of the power in any space where she's able to create her own reality i don't think that means that you can't at all sympathize with what got her to make the decision she did around subverting her grief but that we should also acknowledge how easy it is to sympathize with her because we see her as like this fragile white woman who just made a mistake and it doesn't matter the lives that she traumatized. 
but she absolutely holds a lion share of the power especially when she can create her own reality that is the creation of her own reality that causes harm that causes trauma and there is no atoning for those decisions she and kanye both are surrounded by community that they aren't in community with and the result is a lack of accountability while violence continues to be carried out. The alternative that I would suggest isn't that I think that, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a TV show writer, so I don't really have a different way that WandaVision should have gone. But I think in the idea that a lot of us can relate to the way that she subverted her grief, that it's a good lesson, both in the way that those of us who could relate to the motifs of grief in WandaVision and those who hold Kanye as an aspirational figure or even relate to him as a genius or a talent or godlike figure, wherever you fall on that spectrum of fan base of Kanye, that we can, it's also an opportunity to analyze and think critically about grief and the ways in which it actually causes harm when it's not something that we allow ourselves to process. In a system that relies on violence and subjugation, grief's role has been significantly reduced and twisted into a catalyst for more interpersonal violence instead of occupying the more natural role as a step toward healing. So if we talk about it, we could be more cognizant about it. But we are left to wonder if our society even affords room for true communal healing in the aftermath of harm. Both Kanye and Wanda, when confronted with immense grief, instead reimagine themselves as gods with no consideration of who they harm. Healing in such an oppressive system is truly a radical act. So it's not a surprise if it has no place in a patriarchal capitalistic society. Grief has seemingly become a tool for sustaining the power imbalance by any means necessary. But instead I want us to consider grief as part of our healing process. Grief as not a way for us to have to get out of it or move out of it in a godlike way or come out as a supreme being on the other side. I think grief might also be motivating a lot of the light skin, light colored eye, homophobic spiritual crystal girlies. Be careful who you buy your crystals from. Have you processed your grief, babe? What is grief to you? Mm. Rather than us repositioning ourselves as the soothsayers, as the powerful, as the ones that are able to guide society and take on this paternalistic lens, I do think we should start to think about how we set up a sort of pastoral care, communal care, towards allowing people the opportunity to grieve. Thanks for watching, and as always, thanks to Henny for collaborating, and thanks to Audible for sponsoring this video. If you are new here, use my audible.com link to get your first month free, audible.com slash Julesy, or text Julesy to 500, 500 and get your month's first month free. And come on over to the Patreon, because me and Henny will be having a discussion on our different thoughts, our different critiques on WandaVision and Genius as a whole. See you on the other side. Deuces!